Good evening. evening. Oh, I love that. Welcome to Auto Reform Church. Uh, why don't we stand and welcome each other into the house of the Lord?
Please be seated. When my wife and I pray together, we often pray prayers of, well, Lord, be with so-and-so and be with so-and-so. But I've been thinking a lot about that. Instead of just asking that God be with someone, I'm, I want to pray that they really hold fast to Christ, that they really hold fast to God. Psalm 92 really gets at the heart of the matter. It, 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 it talks about holding fast to God, really holding on, on to God. In verse 14, it says this, because the person holds fast to me in love, God says, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he, he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. I love that idea that, uh, that our prayer is not only that God be with them, but our prayer is that they will hold fast to Christ with all their heart mind and soul. So as we go to prayer tonight, are there any prayer concerns that someone has or a joy that you'd like to share? Um, again, Kay Headley, um, he, she has uh, compression fractures in her back, so we need to pray for Kay. Um, are there any others this evening? Oh, way over there. Yes. Thank you, Mitch. And for those of who couldn't hear and for those at home, um, the young man that we've been praying for, Owen, who was in that car accident from Zealand West. Are you from Zealand West? Yeah. Um, they're taking, removing medication and trying to, trying to bring him out of his coma. Uh, he was in induced coma. And um, it's starting to look OK. I mean, it's starting to respond. So we need to continue to pray for Owen. Thank you, Tim. Um, Tim asked us to pray for the truck driver who, uh, who hit, hit Owen. Um, wasn't that the truck driver's fault, but we can, it's just devastating to be in any kind of accident. Yeah. Thanks, Minnie. Um, the 24-hour prayer event in Holland, I, I confess, Minnie asked me this morning, did you go? And I said, I sat in my office this morning and looked at the card, and I went, oh, I got to go to this. And then I looked at the dates, and it was this past week. So, uh, but she was saying how powerful it was. And uh, of course, our country, uh, our society, our culture really desperately needs prayer. Thank you, Minnie. Any others? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have um, very difficult legislation coming up on Tuesday night or Tuesday that we need to vote, vote, make sure we vote proposal three. And uh, we definitely need to pray for the children. Thank you. Any others? Yeah, Bernie. A joy. 
Thank you, Bernie. I would repeat what you said, but I'm, I, I don't know if I can do it without letting tears come to my eyes, so <laughs> thank you. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, your word tells us that you hold fast to us. Your word also encourages us to hold fast to you in love. And if we do, if we hold fast to you, if we really hold on to you, you will deliver us, you will protect us. You hear our, our calls for help. Your word promises us that you answer us. When trouble comes our way, when problems overwhelm us, Lord, your word tells us to hold fast to you. Lord, forgive us for the times when we get so distracted by our own agendas, our own desires, our own whatever it is, Lord, that we, we forget to hold fast to you. Lord, we live in a world that seems to be losing its grip on you, that's letting go of you. So, Lord, we, we pray for the world around us. We pray for the, uh, our nation. We pray for our communities. We pray, O oh Lord, for the culture around us. In many ways, Lord, it feels like we've gone back to the days of the early church. When only the, the small, faithful few, Lord, followed you and believed in you. And they lived in a world that, Lord, did not have a clue who you were. Lord, may we be bold in our faith. We pray, Lord, as the early disciples did, we pray for boldness. May we be bold, Lord, as we, as we vote this week. May we be bold, Lord, as we, as we think about the unborn children. May we be bold, Lord, in our trust in you. May we hold fast to you, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray that those in our bulletin, those on our hearts, those in our minds, those that we've mentioned tonight, Lord, will they hold fast to you. Lord, we pray for Kay, Lord, and the difficulties with her back. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for Owen, Lord, who this young man who was in an accident, and we're thankful, Lord, that he, he's slowly, Lord, waking up. We pray that that will continue, Lord. Restore him. We pray for this truck driver, Lord, who, who hit him. Lord, to live with the grief, to live with knowing, Lord, that you, Lord, that somebody was hurt in this accident. Lord, I just pray for this truck driver that you ease his heart. Lord, we're thankful for those who went to the 24-hour prayer. Lord, we're thankful for a, praying ch for a praying church. We're, pray we're thankful for all those churches, Lord, around us that are praying desperately and holding fast to you. Lord, we're thankful for our friend Bernie that even though, Lord, he had a surgery, a major surgery this week, he is here tonight with us, holding fast to you. Lord, we lift up others. We lift up Elvin Geertman, Lord, who is responding well, uh, not responding well to dialysis. Lord, we pray that for him, and we're thankful, Lord, that, that he is home, but we pray, Lord, that he'll continue to recover. We lift up Joanne Hoke, Lord, who has a broken arm. 
We pray for her healing and Sandy Martin as well, who is going to have a heart catheterization uh, tomorrow, Lord. And Ron Miedema, Lord, who continues to undergo tests, who continues, Lord, to we pray for his complete recovery. Del Vandenbosch, Lord, who's going to be having knee replacement surgery. And Sean Deemer, Lord, who, who's had back surgery, we pray, Lord, that he, you heal him. And Kim Clausen as well, Lord. We're thankful for some of the improvements, Lord, that she's getting from this new medicine. But, Lord, we just continue to pray that for she struggles with balance and strength in her, Lord. For Derek, Lord, we pray for his continued healing of his body. And Lord, we pray that for those that are struggling with cancer, Cindy Jacobs with lung cancer, and Barb Williams, who also has lung cancer, the grandmother of Travis Barber, Lord, who's struggling with cancer, and Nelson Braidaway, Lord, with bone cancer. Lord, we continue to pray for John, Legia, Lord, with bone cancer as well. And Kevin and Clark and Dave Hintz, who struggle with prostate cancer. Lord, we pray for Amy and her family. Amy DeCryder. Lord, we just pray for strength as she holds fast to you. We pray for Michelle, Lord, who, and for Roger, Lord, both relatives of Sarah Mazurik, one struggling with breast cancer and the other with multiple melanoma. For Eric Hogawin, Lord, with colon cancer and Marcia Cloyd, Lord, as well. We, we just remember these people, Lord. May they not only find healing, may they not only be in your presence, but may, Lord, we just ask that they hold fast to the God who created them. Lord, we remember in our prayers Dan and Jody, Cody, Wyatt, and Jody's mom. And Lord, we think of our shut-ins, Francis Fry and Carol Headley and Ken Merriman. And those in kid, Kids Hope, Lord, and those in the military, Daniel and Chris and Robin and Janet and Logan. And Lord, we are most thankful, Lord, for your word. Lord, Teach us, Lord. Teach us tonight through your Holy Spirit. We pray all this in the name of our one and only Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, open up your word to us. Speak to us, Lord, through your spirit. Lord, for we come to you wanting to know more of who you are, wanting to know you, Lord, in a deeper way. And so, Lord, help us to understand your word, to, to really to, to listen to each word and to, to know, Lord. To know, Lord, what it is to be your follower, to be your disciple. So, Lord Jesus, speak to us through this word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message tonight, it's Your Serve, and it's John chapter 13, 1 through 20. And it's found on page uh, 1069 in your pew Bible, which is right underneath your seat. If you're not familiar with that, it's right underneath. So I want you to take out your Bible because tonight we're going to go through. I usually put up the passages on the screen, but I do have some, but most of it we're just going to go right, look right through the text tonight. The title is, It's Your Serve. Years ago, I want to say, oh, 35, well, more than 35 years, because Linda and I have been married for 35 years. I want to say it's more like 38 years. I went up to a camp called Spring Hill Camp up in Everett. It's right in the middle of the, the lower peninsula. And I met this wonderful fellow. His name was Ina Golson. He was the founder of the camp. He was an evangelical free church pastor, but he found God's call in, in founding this camp for kids. And I'll never forget Enoch. He was the fellow, the pastor who eventually uh, performed the service when Linda and I got married. But when I first met him, I was amazed. He was a phenomenal speaker. He was a phenomenal preacher. He was one of those people that when he would preach, you, you just couldn't, you didn't want it to end. You just wanted to continue to listen because it was very profound. And he had a, just a wonderful way of communicating words to people about who Jesus Christ is. I'll never forget, here was this phenomenal speaker, founder of this camp. One day I had to go and ask him a question, and so I made my way up to the office, expecting Enoch to be in the main office, but no. I asked, I said, where is Enoch? And, and they said, well, he's out, out, out in the camp. And I said, where? And they kind of directed me out there, and we were going to build a new bathhouse, a new restroom facility. And I went out, and I moseyed out there, and I, I walked through the camp, and I got out there, and there Enoch was on the backhoe of this, you know, this big machine, clearing the land for this new bathhouse uh, facility. And it was a hot day, and Enoch got off the backhoe. He saw me coming, and he got off the backhoe, and he, he comes over, and he had this he had this plaid shirt on, I remember, in jeans and cowboy boots, and he was filthy from head to toe. And I remember he had taken out a handkerchief and wiping his face, and, and as I talked to him, I thought, here is the founder of this camp. It wasn't just any camp. This was, at the time, this was the largest Christian camp in the United States. And here was this man just humbly serving, I thought, certainly there must be somebody else who, who could be doing this. Doesn't he have other important things to do? But I was always amazed at Enoch. When anything needed to be done around the camp, whether it was clearing land or taking out the garbage or cleaning toilets, Enoch, nothing was beneath his service. Nothing was beneath his willing to serve. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're doing a sermon series through the Gospel of John, and, and this is a complicated passage. Most people think it's pretty easy, but there's some complications to it. The pace of John's writing slows down substantially. For the first 12 chapters, the first 12 chapters covers, covers Jesus' life for three years. In 12 chapters, three years. 
Now we get to chapter 13 and everything slows down. In fact, the next six chapters covers just one night. That's all it covers. So this text, we got to pay really close attention to. This text demands that every Christian answer two questions. One is, who are you following? That's the first half of the text. And the other is, how are you living your life? In other words, what is your serve like? I want to dive into the first question. How are you following Jesus? How are you following, or, or who are you following? We're going to ask who you're following, and then, then how are you following? Let's read the first part of the text, verses 1 through 11. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of, his, out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, who was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what, am I, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. I'm going to stop right there. As I read the text again and again in my office this week, I was disappointed because I read a bunch of commentaries, different scholars, and I, was, I really got upset because scholar after scholar seemed to ignore the context of this passage. When we study the Bible, we should never ignore the context ever. So that's where we're going to start tonight. We're going to look at the context. Look at verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 36 through 37. On the same page, just look up to verse 30, 30, 36 and 37. There's a little title in the ESV, the unbelief of the people, right in the middle of verse 36. I'm going to start with the very first, the part of that very first verse. So 36 says, while you have the light, Jesus says, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Jesus had performed all these signs and, and they, they didn't believe. The crowd didn't believe. So there was a lot of controversy. There was a lot of, let's say, conflict about who Jesus was. That's the context of this passage. There was conflict. Now, look down at verses 42 through 43. Jesus, uh, John gives us list, these verses from Isaiah. But then look down at verse 42. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. 
You see, some people, even the authorities, it says, started to believe in Jesus. But then they were afraid of the Pharisees and they were afraid of being kicked out of the, out of the synagogue. Now, we live in a culture where people jump from church to church to church. And so we wouldn't think that's such a huge big deal. But to them, being kicked out of the local synagogue was huge. It was huge. And so they were afraid, so they stopped and they didn't confess Jesus. They didn't publicly believe, you know, confess Jesus, even though they, they thought, well, yes, I, I'll, I'll call myself a Christian in name only, as Pastor Mike pointed out this morning. But then it says this, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So the context of this passage is not only conflict, but it's a sense of pride as well. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to humble myself. I don't want to humble myself publicly before Christ. So they hid their faith. Now look at John chapter 12, verse 48. Jesus says this, the one who rejects me and does not receive my my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Jesus is talking about those who reject him. So the context of this chapter is betrayal. Betrayal. The question is, who are you following? Who are you going to follow? Those closest to Jesus, they struggled with this, about what it means to follow him and how are they going to do it. And, and Luke tells us that this night that they gathered together for Jesus to wash their feet and to, and to share in the Lord's Supper, this night, Luke, the gospel writer of Luke, he tells us that this night started with them arguing amongst themselves about who is the greatest. Look at this passage from Luke. As a, dis a dispute also arose among them as to which of one of them was to be regarded as the greatest, Jesus told them, I am among you as the one who serves. Can you imagine? I could see them walking in like a like school children coming in from the playground, arguing which one is the toughest or which one is the greatest. Or, and that's exactly what they were doing. And this was during the Lord's Supper. We, we don't really talk about that when we share in the supper on a Sunday morning. But the disciples came to that supper arguing who is the greatest amongst them. I can see Jesus just shaking his head, going, when are they going to get it? So this is the context. It's one of conflict and pride and betrayal. This beautiful scene of, of Jesus bending down to wash his disciples' feet. It's entangled in conflict, in pride, and betrayal. I mean, look at these verses again. Verse 2 of our chapter. Look what it says. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knows that Simon's going to betray him. And what does he do in the middle of this betrayal? He gets up and he washes his disciples' feet. Here's another verse. Look down at verse 11. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. And then look again down at verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled by his, in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. What's the common theme here? In all three of those verses, one word sticks out, and that's betrayal, right? It's interesting. I read commentary after commentary, and none of the scholars that I read put this 
in their commentary that this whole feet washing was right in the middle of great betrayal. I think as I read this text again and again and again, that's why I asked the question, who are you following? Who are you following? Are you following the Pharisees? That's what some of the authorities were doing. Who They say they believe, but they, they follow the Pharisees. Are you following the world? I think that's made clear in, the, in that verse 43. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Are you following your fears, your ambitions, your pride? Who are you following? I think that's what this chapter really asks. Who are you following? Jesus knew. He knew that he was going to be betrayed. Such knowledge could have turned a person to bitterness. It could have turned a person to, to hatred, but not Jesus. No, he, he didn't turn to bitterness. He didn't turn to, to hatred. In the middle of this betrayal, in the middle of this conflict, in the middle of all this context, it didn't, he didn't turn to bitterness. He didn't turn to hatred. No. In fact, this context, it made his heart Turn to them with greater love. With greater love. It's amazing that, that the more people who, who hurt Jesus, the more he, love he showed. The more, now that's what we're going to see as this plays out. As he, as he goes to the cross, the more they tried to hurt him, the more he loved them. It's so easy, it's so natural to resent wrong, to resent those who betray us. It's so easy to, to, to grow bitter under insult and injury. But Jesus met great injury. When there was great injury, he met it with incredible incredible humility. When there was in great disloyalty, he met it with great, incredible love, did he not? It's amazing, in the midst of this horrible situation, what did he do? He got down on his knees and he washed their feet. How could he do this? I know I, I don't think I have that in my nature. If I was in a situation like that with incredible betrayal, incredible disloyalty, incredible hatred, I don't know if I would be able to sit down and look, look in the eye of those who I know is going to abandon me and wash their feet. How could Jesus do this? Be I think it's because of what he knew. It's what he knew. He knew his life on earth was ending and it was time to return to the Father. Those first, what, five verses or so? Or four verses? Well, actually three. The first three verses. There's a lot of things in there. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart with the world to the go and go to the Father. Verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was now going back to God. Twice, it's very clear in that those passages indicates what he knew. My friends, when we feel a sense of betrayal, when we feel a sense of, of someone has hurt us, it's important to fall back on what we really know. What did he know? He knew that his life on earth was ending and it was time to return to the Father. 
it's interesting, those words, he knew that his life was ending. How do we react when, when we know that maybe life is coming to an end? Again, it's so easy to fall into bitterness. Not Jesus. There was a couple, Lynn and I watched a movie the other night. There was this couple in this movie, and they were atheists. They, they not only disliked religion, but they kind of resented it. People around them were religious, and every time the subject came up, they would kind of push back, or they'd roll their eyes, or they'd be like, no, we're not like that. The husband dies of cancer in the movie, and the wife expresses incredible loss, incredible bitterness, and an overwhelming sense of pain. And I get it, she loved her husband a great deal. But I, I sat there, and as I watched the movie, I thought, contrast this with Christian couples. Yes, there's sorrow. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's, there's, there's a sense of, of what am I going to do? All is lost. But there's not this biting pain. If, you, if you're in a relationship with someone that you've loved for so many years and, and that person is gone, but you know that person is a, a believer, a lover of Christ, there is some hope there. Jesus knew. He knew that he was going back to the Father, says the text. Christians know that when they die, they are going back to the Father. That's where we're going. We're going to the Father. What else did Jesus know? He also knew this, who his true followers were and who was going to betray him. Look at verse 1 again of 13. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, and then look at the second phrase there, having loved his own who were in the world. Having loved his own. I love those words because I was thinking about Pastor Mike's sermon this morning he made a really big deal that we are not our own, but we belong to Christ. My friends, Jesus knew his own. He knew who his true followers were. He knew who was going to betray him. He knew who belonged to him. Were these perfect people? No. Peter would deny him. Thomas would doubt him. The disciples would abandon him on the cross when he's on the cross. But the text says he knew them. He knew them. And my friends, he loved them, that he loved his followers. What does it say? Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I like that translation. He loved them to the end. It could be that he loved them to the end of his life. He, he loved them to the end of time. But mm, you could translate that another way. In Greek, it could be translated, he loved them to the utmost. He loved them to the utmost. I like that, one, that translation better. He loved them more than anything else. He loved them... To the utmost, I, I, you know, Lynn and I have become grandparents for the first time. And although little Noah Jane is not here with us in Michigan, Elizabeth likes to FaceTime me so I can see her. Saturday morning I spent, I want to say, a good half hour, 45 minutes just watching Noah sleep. I'm beginning to love her to the utmost. To the utmost. Jesus loved his followers. Look at verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, Jesus knew. He knew that he had 
all things under his power. Such consciousness might have or could have filled the average person with pride, could have filled Jesus with pride, and yet it didn't. The knowledge of his power, the knowledge of his glory, what did he do with that knowledge? What did he do with that power? He washed their feet. At the moment when he had, he had the opportunity for supreme pride, he showed supreme humility. Real love is like that. Real love is like that. That's what it means to love someone to the utmost. When someone falls ill, the person who loves them will perform the most menial tasks, the most menial services, because, because love is just like that. Years ago, when I was going into ministry, Linda and I were newly married. We moved to New Jersey. I was in the seminary, and I got hired by this church to just be an assistant, just to help out. But every time I had to do something in the service, whether it was preach or simply pray or do the children's message, I get it when people do the children's message and they're nervous. I get it because when I was in that church, and it only had a, it was a small church, I would get literally physically ill before that service. I mean, I would have to go into the bathroom and throw up because I was so nervous. And I remember one time we hadn't even left the apartment and I just had to give the children's message and I was so nervous I was in the bathroom sick. And I remember Linda coming in and rubbing my back and just showing me some love and grace. Because that's what you do when someone you love is ill. You will do whatever it takes. You will love them to the utmost. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus got down on his hands and knees and washed their feet. That's what he did. When Jesus came to Peter, however, Peter was interesting. Peter, Peter goes, what? Look at verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never Wash my feet. Why? Because washing someone's feet was the position of a slave. It was the position of a servant. They had come in after a long day's walk or whatever they were doing, and Jesus gets this towel and he's going to wash their feet. And Peter, I would imagine, was embarrassed that Jesus, the, the master, the teacher, the rabbi, would get down on his hands and knees and wash the feet of the disciples. And he says, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet. I can see Jesus looking into his eyes and saying, Peter, who are you following? Jesus told Peter, if he doesn't allow him to wash his feet, you will have no part or share of me. I wonder, what does it mean to have a share in Jesus? Look at verses 8 through 10. Let me read them again. Let me look. It says this, Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet, Jesus. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. Peter wants Jesus to wash all of him. Okay, Jesus, I get it. You need to wash my hands and my head as well. You need to wash all of me. And Jesus tells Peter, if he doesn't need to be bathed again, he just needs his feet washed. 
in this culture, the way it worked was people would bathe and they would clean all of them, but then when they would go about their business for the day, they would walk everywhere, and of course, their feet would get filthy. Notice the difference here in the words between bathe and wash. Peter says, wash all of me. And Jesus says, no, you don't need to bathe again. Not entirely bathe. You just need to be washed. Notice the difference in the words. What does it mean to share in Jesus? By bathing, Jesus is saying a once and for all bathing means being cleansed by my living word. Notice, he basically says, Peter, you are clean already. You came to this meal clean. What does it mean that he was clean? He had already been bathed. He had already been cleansed. Look at chapter 6. Go over to me, with me to chapter 6 of John, and I want you to notice this, this text. This is verse 60. John chapter 6, it's on 10, page 1060. All the way down to verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Jesus is talking about communion. And he said, if you, if you want to abide in me, you've got you to gotta drink my blood. You've got to eat my body. And, and they're, like, they're like amazed. They're like, what is going on? So he says, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to, to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he, has, he was before? In other words, he's going to go be with the Father, right? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Notice that, pat, that text right there. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who, who, those, were, who those were who did not believe and who it would be to betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is, is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go as away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And, he, and we have believed and, and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You know, it's a very similar text. No, there's no washing. No, there's no basin. No, there's no towel. But there's a very similar text here because we're talking about betrayal. We're talking about a struggle to believe. And Jesus tells them that they're cleansed by the words of life. Jesus teaches them that they are cleansed by these words the words that he has given them. He repeats it again in John chapter 15. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus tells Peter that he doesn't need to bathe again because he's been cleansed by the words of life that he has taught them. Peter just needs his feet clean. That's it. He just needs his feet washed. That's all. So what does it mean that to have one's feet washed, a regular washing, the renewal of our daily walk by the confessing of sin, repentance, and having the mindset of Christ. So Jesus is saying to Peter that he has been cleansed by listening and accepting his words. All Peter needs is just this regular daily walk with him. Peter needs to put on this mindset of Christ. As Paul put it this way, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves 
which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by the taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul is telling Christians here to follow in the footsteps of, of, of Jesus by humbling yourself. By washing his disciples' feet, Jesus has invited them to do the same thing. This brings us, and I know I, I'm, I've got, I'm running out of time, but let me just do this quickly. The second question is this. Oh, did I skip it? I, I took it out. How are you living your life? There's a contrast here between what Jesus knew and what he did. And what the followers of his disciples knew and what they need to do. In the context of them arguing, in the context of them arguing who is the greatest... What did Jesus want his disciples to know? What did Jesus want his disciples to do? There's a contrast here. Look at these verses. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's read quickly the second part of this chapter. I mean, second part of this, these verses this is starting with verse 12. Watch this. And when he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and resumed his place. He said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, notice the words, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. He starts the passage out, do you understand what I have done? And then he, under, he ends the passage, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There's a little sandwich here. And in the middle of that sandwich, he tells them to follow my example. In the context of arguing who is the greatest, he tells them, he tells them that they must do what he's done. Look at verse 14 again. If I then, your Lord and your, and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I don't know if Jesus is telling us to literally do that. I hope not. I don't, I'm not one of those people that like people looking at my feet. I, I don't want people touching my feet. I don't like anybody other than Linda to touch me. <laughs> really. We go on these cruises, and she, she always likes to get a massage. I'm like, no, I'm not going to have anybody touch me. Jesus wants us to be servants. In other words, it's your serve. It's your serve. When my dad was alive, we played a lot of racquetball. Oh, man, he used to wipe me across the court. He, he was one of those people that would hit the ball and it would hit the corner and would dribble across the court. I told him on one time, I said, Dad, if you do that one more time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on your back. Sure enough, he hits the ball and it dribbles across, just across the floor. It rolls practically. There's no way I could get to it, but I ran and I pushed him as hard as I could up against the wall. And he's like, Hey, what are we doing here? We're just playing a game. It was all in good fun. But then he would smile at me when it was my turn to serve, and he'd just say, it's your serve. It's your serve. 
And I think that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. I have served you. Now it's your time. It's your serve. Some people serve naturally. Martha, it was amazing at serving. Remember Mary and Martha? Martha, she had hospitality down. Others struggle to serve. It's not in their gift mix. I know when we have people over the house, Linda has the amazing gift of hospitality. I have the amazing gift of just chit-chat. Occasionally she'll have to say to me, Jim, get them something to drink or get them this because hospitality kind of gets lost on me. Some people really struggle if they serve and they're not appreciated, they get angry. Others do, don't want to be served because it f- makes them feel inadequate or vulnerable or, or they don't feel like they're in control if other people are serving them. I liked oh, last month when the queens passed away and the, the line around the London went for miles took hours and hours and hours for people to get through the line so that they could pay the respects to the queen. I'm not a soccer fan, but I was amazed. But the fellow, David Beckham, he's a retired soccer star. He stood in line for 12 hours with people in line, like normal people. He didn't cut the line because he's famous. He just stood there and and did what everybody else did. My friends, as I look at people at our Reformed Church, I'm amazed at how many people just serve here. They just serve. I'm amazed at how many volunteers it takes to run the children's ministry or any of the ministries. And people just stand up and serve. What did Jesus want them to know? Jesus wanted his followers to know his humble spirit. Peter Peter didn't understand this at first. None of his disciples did. Jesus answered Peter, what I'm going to do, what I'm doing, you do not understand. You don't understand it now, but but afterward you will. I think it took Peter quite a while to understand because years later he wrote this, but he did understand. He said, clothe yourselves with all all of you with humility and toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that, that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. I wonder if Peter, as Peter wrote this years later, I wonder if he was thinking of that night when they all gathered together and they were arguing who is the greatest, and Jesus got down and he served them. And one was going to betray him. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. I can imagine Peter, this was in Peter's, that night of the foot washing was in Peter's mind when he wrote this. How should we live our lives? This means we need to be careful. We need to be completely humble. Humility is something that's difficult. We have to be careful with humility humility because we have to be careful about what motivates us. Some people, for some people, the desire for approval motivates their care for others. For some people, their desire for approval motivates their humility Some people are motivated by what others think of them. But this isn't the reason we should serve or care for others. Jesus, for Jesus, his care for others expressed who he was. And it did not depend on the response of others. Can you imagine living with that freedom? Jesus didn't care what others thought of him. 
He served because of who he was. You see, it's your serve, my friends. We must wash each other's feet by encouraging each other in the faith. That's what we do. As I walked out to see Enoch that day, I was amazed at the man who had founded this enormous camp. The largest Christian camp in the United States. And there he was, in his backhoe, serving, washing the feet of those around him. My friends, it's your serve. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, Jesus, thank you for walking us through this difficult text. Reminding us what it means to really follow you. Lord, as Pastor Mike reminded us this morning, we're not saved by works. But those works need to be a celebration of our salvation. Lord, when we serve, when we humbly serve one another, let those works be a celebration of the grace that we have in you. Help us, Lord, to be gracious to one another. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please rise for the benediction if you're able. My friends, the benediction is simple. It's your serve. Go out and encourage each other in the faith, serving one another. I know you do, because I see it every day. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.